Businesses are increasingly recognising, as Simon said, that, that the usual way in which they've been engaging with the consumers and manufacturing products really are, are over, and I think it's a case really very much of, of recognising what is the viable option for the future. The true pioneers, and some of you will be in the room here today, I'm sure, will recognise that if your products and services are not sustainable in future, then you may not have a business in future. And it's really a case of ensuring that, DNA, that your DNA, your corporate DNA, actually reads with sustainability. Which brings me to BSI. Um, obviously, we would say we are pioneers in our own way of sustainable standards. Um, 20 years ago, in 1992, we published the world's first environmental management standard, BS 7750, the same year as the Rio Earth Summit. Uh, that was rapidly adopted by ISO to become the standard I'm sure you're familiar with now, which is ISO 14001. And that continues to bring real value to millions of customers globally, 250,000 of which are certified. Standard? Well, at BSI, we would say that a standard is effectively the distilled wisdom of what good looks like. And we believe it's really important to continue to bring together experts and stakeholders to define what good looks like in areas beyond just environmental management, increasingly into areas such as energy management, energy efficiency, carbon management, responsible sourcing, sustainable procurement, traceability, social responsibility. It's been said many times before, and Simon just said it already again, that sustainability is a journey. So some of you, as Simon said, will be beginning that journey. Some of you have already started to make strides forward. It's, it's quite uh, the case, I'm sure, that businesses recognise where they can make the most in impact, and that's where they start in terms of sustainability. In terms of BSI, we, we do offer end-to-end -end solutions. So we, we help shape and share good practice through our standards, but also we provide the means by which you can embed excellence into your organisation through training and also a certification as well. Uh, whilst it's, it's the case certainly through our, our committees that we actually uh, can identify where um, we can help develop good practice that meets the needs of the market. It's only when I come actually to an event like this and actually listen, as what we'll be doing shortly, I'm sure, at the networking, to what actually is um, keeping you awake at night and the, the, the scars and the pains you, you have on a day-to-day -day basis, that we can actually help develop tomorrow's standards as well. Yeah, yeah. I, I look at sustainability as business resilience. You know, it's the ability for all of us to prosper in a resource-constrained world. You know, so that's got to be socially, economically, and environmentally. You know, so we've we've got to obviously create employment going forward. We all need growth. You know, that's how we lift people out of poverty. But it's all going to happen in a resource-constrained world. For us builders, we wrestle with the term sustainability, and one of the big problems that historically the construction industry has always had is when the sustainability word pops up we go very green and it's all recycling energy saving so on and so forth yeah. um, what i try to say to to our business is very similar we use the people planet profit model um, it's a three-way set of scales and you've got to balance that three-way set of scales so the profit you know, we make no no um, no apology of, of raising that because we're in business to try and make uh, make a good a good good profit. But similarly, under the people side, you need to find that balance of looking after your own staff, looking after your clients, looking after your trade contractors, and then finally the environmental under the planet. So that's the best way that I try and get across what sustainability is. So Viridor um, is probably a very large company that most of you have never heard of because we deal with waste, you know, what people create and want nothing more to do with. Uh, and when I joined Viridor, it was 95% landfill. That's what we did. We got our trucks, we took it to a hole in the ground, buried it. We thought it was very innovative and cutting edge because we used to cap them and drill wells and extract gas, create electricity, sell that to the grid, create, uh, you know, a good revenue stream from that. But the Viridor that I work for today is totally different. You know, we have moved now to 50% or more of our profits come from recycling and energy recovery. You know, we're the largest operator of material recovery facilities in the UK. 
We're investing £1.5 billion now in energy from waste facilities because you can't recycle everything yet, and we probably won't for a long time. So we have this residual waste to deal with. So we're building these EFW plants uh, to create energy and heat from, those, uh, from that residual waste. But where do I come in as head of sustainable business? Well, I'm actually trying to help deliver Viridor's uh, sustainable solution of recycling and, and, and energy recovery, but I want Viridor to do it in a very sustainable way. I want to make sure we use energy efficiency, efficiently, water efficiently, and resources efficiently. I think for a few companies now, they are seeing that their very business model is going to be dependent on the way in which they manage this dynamic. Um, so that they really do understand um, what the contribution is from the natural environment. So Puma with its profit and loss account across the supply chain. If you take a company like a sportswear company like Puma, you say, well, you know, what is their real dependence on the natural environment, first of all? You say, well, actually, you're a company that, you know, cotton shirts, leather shoes for trainers. Actually, without that, then they have a quite tough business model. What they've done is they've mapped out and said, well, what's the financial value of our supply chain in terms of dependencies of the environment, and we factor that into the way in which we make decisions, okay? And I think the, the bolder, more um, forward-looking companies have much more, taken a much more leading approach to integrating environment and social issues into right at the top. Okay. I think I would call that a, a fairly thin veneer at the moment. Um, in that it isn't driving all businesses um, at the very top. But I think as some of the more strategic risks that organizations are facing now um, is pushing them in this direction. I can give a couple of examples maybe. Um, one is um, financial. Um, we live in uh, an economy which you know, our chancellor of the Exchequer um, has publicly said that over the lifetime of this parliament, um, environmental taxation will increase as a proportion of revenue to the Treasury. Okay? So he's scratching his head at the moment thinking, why is it that people are questioning issues around affordability from green levies and green taxes and all the rest of it? But it's this chancellor and the coalition uh, as an entity that said they were going to increase this. Why were they going to do that? Because they wanted to see behavior change within the economy and to drive much more um, issues about resource efficiency. So that's, that, that's one aspect. Um, the natural world is changing and the availability and competition for resources internationally is also a key issue. And when you start to look at the government's resource security action plan and the way in which some companies are now seeing that this really is affecting um, the way in which they put together their supply chains, um, that, that, that's also quite interesting because it is forcing them to rethink things. If you read the Plan A report from m and then over the last few years they've invested quite a significant amount of um, organisational internal capital um, and intellectual capital in their Plan A. What they now are able to do is to quantify financially the benefits of that program, and that gives them a net profit of £135 million a year. So their latest Plan A report says that, that that's what they're doing. Um, but I think also when you look at the ambition of the real corporate leaders, um, then they set some really, really aggressive targets. And when they set those targets, they don't know how they're going to achieve them. And I think that takes a really brave organization to publicly say, OK, by 2020, we're going to have done this. And yet today in 2013, we're not sure how we're going to do it. But we're going to put together our organization to deliver on that. And by doing that, we're going to have to embed this into all parts of our business. And we're going to have to catalyze innovation. For once, do I say the construction industry are um are leading the way. Uh, we talked about retail, we talked about M&S, we talked about Sainsbury's. The big risk is supply chain bashing. That's where you set all these targets and then you just pass it down to your supply chain. And I would imagine everyone in this room may have, um, may have suffered that sort of effects. Um, 
something revolutionary is happening in the construction industry. The major contractors have got together and they've created a supply chain sustainability school uh, for anyone associated with the construction industry. So you don't have to actually be a, you know, it could be supplying reaper graphics or, you know, uh, any other service. It's free, it's, um, it's bespoke for each company. You go on, you register, do a self-assessment, and then it just takes you on this journey of, you know, eight or ten modules, how you can go forward. That's really embracing sustainability in, in what I perceive as the proper way, working with your supply chain to come along the journey together, rather than just passing down and trying to, uh, you know, to get performance by, by third parties. Because I think that, as well, to go back to that very first question, is the difference between maybe an organisation that's implementing what they believe to be a sustainable management system, but in reality is probably just limited to an environmental management system, probably because they're being forced in some way. It's the, the agenda has been forced upon them as opposed to them as a collective coming, coming up with the idea that they want to now move forward in this area, versus an organisation that's truly implementing hmm. a sustainable management hmm. system and has got the true buy-in of not only the board but, but every level down and, and also nodding along with Martin there for, the, um, for recognising the role of the person who has been tasked with delivering the sustainable performance. I find um, you know, in, in going out and auditing organisations against their sustainable performance, you can be meeting with anybody from a director to somebody working um, in the lab or in the engineering department. So at almost at any level with a business who's been tasked with this role, and often it's when you're actually, you know when you're going to go and meet with somebody straight away when you're invited and that person is sitting at the board or a senior management position, that hopefully this is really going to be a truly meaningful um, management system. Whereas you know straight away when you go to meet the person who's sort of been given it as an add-on job, it's possibly because they haven't got the support that they're doing it for that tick in the box. Resilience. You've got to have an exceptional level of personal resilience and be prepared to sort of step over sort of naysayers about what you're doing. But when you go to, you know, I've, I've recruited a dedicated energy efficiency manager who's got 20 years of experience. You know, he'll go into a site and identify all these opportunities and suddenly we're finding projects with paybacks of three months, six months. You know, and you, you're getting real interest from people. Um, but also on Martin's point about sort of targets, you know, when you, when you set these targets, don't be frightened to fail. You know, I, I set some targets three years, well, two years ago now to try and sort of make us 20% more energy efficient over a, a, a five-year period. But the economic realities, meant, you know, trying to set those relatively against revenue and things like that, economic realities meant that they weren't possible or don't look like they're going to be possible. Um, so you've got to find ways of sort of recalibrating and uh, changing the way that you, you, you communicate those targets. And I think it's more important to have a stretch target further on and rely on innovation and you know ideas and, and things like that to, to get there rather than sort of just chipping away because yeah. it's the tyranny of the present mm. yeah. yeah the journey towards achieving the target can yeah. be almost more important sometimes than the actual achievement of that maybe that really challenging target you would yeah. if you exactly. if you make significant progress along the way that in itself yeah. can make a significant difference yeah. yes i've got a we took the the strategy that our targets must be realistic to build that feel-good factor and to get people on board. If you set um, any target which you're going to struggle to to reach, all of a sudden there's an air of failure. And if there's an air of failure, it's a case of, oh, really, maybe it's not for me sort of thing. So we deliberately set achievable targets, not too many. We kept it simple and we kept it in line with our core business. I think one of the big things with sustainability, it's such a large you know, a field that you can very, very quickly get bogged down in too many targets, too many objectives. Empowerment, the gentleman said there, um, you know, it's got to be a mindset, it's got to be a culture. 
that's tricky because people don't like change. As soon as you say, you know, this is a great thing for this company, the instant reaction is, well, I like the way we used to do it. You know, why, why are we going down this different path? So it, that's key. And what we did is we just empowered each part of our business, yeah. whether it's sales, whether it's pre-contract, whether it's construction, whether it's aftercare, give them the ownership, sowed a few seeds. You've got to listen to your organisation because ultimately they're the people that do it. And if you're going to get that cultural shift, they're the people that you need on board. You know, I, I set this um, carbon reduction plan, you know, if we become 4% more efficient year on year and all that sort of stuff. And, and it quickly fell apart because, as I say, it was linked to revenue. But when I sort of recalibrated that and restated it, I'm saying we're going to save 5,000 tonnes of carbon. But what does 5,000 tonnes of carbon mean to people? Well, actually, what it means in our business, fossil carbon, electricity, gas, derv, gas oil, it means a million pounds savings a year. So you save a million pounds off your bottom line, what does that relate to in terms of revenue that you would have to generate? Mm. So you have to recalibrate your language. So the C word is cost, not carbon. Mm. Yeah. I think uh, if we look back, it started, um, started really coming out from our annual reports. Uh, we're listed, you know, it's, it was something that uh, every year when we release our annual report, sustainability section um, was viewed as a barometer, how you're doing against your peers, and also to make uh, sure that you're a good organisation and doing the, you know, the right things for the right reason. We certainly moved on a long way from, from there. Um, construction, as with most, uh, most industries, is, uh, is found... Um, you know, quite a challenging time since the third quarter 2008, and you know we've had a good look, and we don't really want to be ahead of the competition. We we want to try and be in a different place. The only way you can get that sort of paradigm movement is uh, is by doing different things. Okay. So we've looked from from Morgan Lovell and Overbury's perspective at the whole way we do business, how we relate to our clients, how we relate to our supply chains, how we operate ourselves as, as a business. Um, things like, uh, for the construction company, uh, uh, industry, building information modelling is, is coming across the, uh, you know, the horizon. Uh, what does that mean? It just means that we need to plan far better, be more effective, coordinate uh, all parts of, of any project and some of the savings both financially and you know uh, environmentally are, are astonishing if you just take that step back in and uh, and embrace you know a, a proper program linking on to that it's our ability as a office refurbishment and fit out company how we can influence our clients mm -hmm. uh, they're laid they're not used to construction so just having that ability of, of sowing some seeds on how they can improve not just their environmental performance, but their productivity um, and bottom line, their, their profitability yep. is a big, big part of that. And we can't say to organisations, that's what you can achieve if we haven't done it ourselves. So it's really, you know, walking the walk. Obviously, for anything to happen, you've got to have top management commitment, mm. and people need to be aware. You need a, a champion on the main board. Um, you need someone there to say, "Yes, we're going to go for this." One of the big risks of that empowerment is if you don't give people the enough time, in addition to their day job, they won't do it. But I think the key to success is not to have it as a bolt-on. You do this, 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 and then spend an hour a day sustainability. It's to just build it into your performance, to your targets, so it just becomes you know, part of your day job, um, and then slowly but surely it will it will you know, become second nature. So one of our um, it was a, um, a finalist in one of our awards, but he was a graduate and went into a company and within 12 months had saved them £170,000 of net savings from resource efficiency. And it was by him doing that that led to that organisation saying, OK, well, 
Yeah, th there's there's something in this, and this was a re this was a well-known company actually that hadn't really embraced this, um, paid some lip service to it, hadn't really got it, and yet all of a sudden some young person comes in um, straight out of university, generates 170,000 pounds worth of savings, and then that person has that ambition to say, and I'd like to do more because these are the other opportunities that we have, and all of a sudden that sort of like wakes people up in the, in the organization. And that person starts to say, well, these are the barriers to me being more successful. And so you can have it coming from a bottom up rather than have to have everybody top down. I formed an energy efficiency technical group with some internal experts, and we're looking for some top down initiatives, stuff that we can roll out on scale across the business. So we operate transfer stations, material recycling facilities, they use a lot of lighting, mm. you know, if we're operating 24-7, that, that sort of thing. Um, so we've, we're, we're literally rolling out LED lighting across the whole business. Uh, you know, it's been a fantastic business case with a good payback, but excuse the pun, it's a very visible energy efficiency mm. initiative. We can show that there's some commitment to, to what we're doing. Um, so yeah, I think you've got to do some top down, but give you know create the skill sets. We're running energy efficiency workshops. Manish is the energy efficiency manager. Mm -hmm. He's on those, delivering at site level. So you build the knowledge from the top, but do some top down initiatives as well. Um, going back to 9001, um, people get very hung up in the construction industry on the term quality. So one of my biggest successes, we're throwing all that quality nonsense out the window. I'm bringing in business management. Quality is finished. I'm not having another word said about quality. It's business management. Instantly, it's a breath of fresh air. They know what we're talking about. They associate quality with form filling. They don't. They associate business with efficiency and money making. Sustainability. That word sustainability is one of the one of the blockers that I find. Mm -hmm. um, because people aren't comfortable with it. It's just about continual improvement and that's the way you do your business. Um, I think communication strategy is key. Mm -hmm. um, if you start, similar to what Andrew said, if you start talking about a language which people don't understand, you'll just lose them straight away. Mm -hmm. Similarly, if you, you know, that balance of needs to be just right, celebrate success, bring that, uh, that collective feel-good factor, but do it on a balanced, uh, yeah, balanced approach, not continual, we've done this, we've done that. Just uh, the communication, I think, is absolutely critical. Um, but I think if you just look at the cost of energy, or power now, electricity, what's pushing up the cost of power? Green levies. green levies, you know, we, we mm. talked about the, the front page of the sun, scrap this green, you know, but that is not the wholesale cost, it's all these, the, the, these green levies. So the energy price is incentive, or should be incentivizing it, the carbon price on top of that should be incentivizing it. Um, but, it, you know, that, that's the big discussion at the moment, mm. isn't it? It's, it's how high does that have to go to make people to change their behavior? Just on um, the point there about the um, the carbon trading schemes in effect that are coming into place, the whole uh, um, basis of those schemes was you said that the cost of uh, emitting the ton of carbon would be greater than the cost of reducing that ton of carbon in the first place. But at the moment, that market mechanism yeah. isn't working. It's uh, just as cheap to go and buy additional carbon credits out in the open market mm. than it is to reduce the cost. So some of these carbon schemes are sort of being constantly tweaked and tried to be constrained more so that this sort of cap and trade mechanism works and that the cost of emitting becomes greater yeah. than the cost of abatement in the first place. But we're not seeing that quite coming okay. together at the moment. And again I was very proud that Morgan Lovell was the first company in the UK of any description to get 50,001 energy management systems. I'd done that myself. I'm not an energy expert. We just applied a bit of common sense. And I explained the journey that the first thing is, is just monitoring. 
and we put some footprint trackers in, a bit like I've done at home with my daughters. And all of a sudden, between midnight and four o'clock in the morning, we had this huge energy spike and the air conditioning was coming on. Um, although we work hard, there's no one in our offices between 12 and, and four o'clock. That put 10 grand in our back pocket straight away by just you know, managing that. So um, one of the key questions is at what cost sustainability? Um, I always say you cannot afford not to do sustainability mm -hmm. if you're going to be a viable business. At the heart of a standard is a methodology, is a framework that doesn't need, as you said, you don't need to be an energy expert or a sustainability expert or an environmental expert to be able to read the standard and potentially implement it in its basic form. You don't have to have any cost associated with the implementation other than your own um, staff and uh, effort that you need to implement it. You may need um, some expertise or some research to help you in one particular area. But I would say that for the majority of small businesses, in, in one sense there is an advantage in that they know their business inside out. It's more than likely that the person who's tasked with this understands each and every part of the business. So when they're sitting at the very starting point to say, okay, well, how do I impact on the environment? They've maybe got the answers at their fingertips and they can pull that together. Environmental management systems isn't something just for the large corporates. It's definitely something for the smaller organisations as, as well. And it's great to hear mm. that the large corporates are helping um, their suppliers and their customers on that journey. The trick is to find a system that actually suits that business. There is no 14001, the Environmental Management Standard, provides a framework and says um, you need to fulfil certain criteria, but it doesn't tell you exactly how you should go about doing it. And I think to suggest there is a right and a wrong way would be foolhardy, because I'm sure if everybody at the panel here said how they had done it, it would appear very different. And I think some typical pitfalls to try and avoid is that some organisations um, are too broad with their evaluation of their environmental impacts and some are, are too narrow. You need to find that right level so that you can get down into sufficient detail to be able to set the meaningful objectives and targets um, thereafter. And I think what's really important as well is to find a system that suits your business. You know, if, if your business is about um, manufacturing different products, then maybe look at the impacts by way of the different products that you're manufacturing. If your business is primarily around um, you know, providing a service and you're very office-based, then fine, look, look at your impacts more in the way that you're managing your office as your starting point. And, and whilst we do definitely want to encourage people to look at the broader sustainability area, I think people do need to start with a, a chunk that's manageable. You can't fix everything straight away. You need to identify your environment, or your sustainability impacts, and then focus on different proportions as you're moving moving through. Those have been the most successful uh, sustainability systems, and I think there's always ways to reinvigorate your environmental management system that it may have been of called at the beginning, that now hopefully is known within the business as a sustainability management system. Or I would actually agree with um, Neil in that he banned the word quality. I would kind of like to ban the word environment and sustainability as well because it is a business management system. If you are managing your business yeah. effectively, then by default you will be yeah. sustainable, environmental. And we don't really need these words. These words were there to introduce us to the concepts, but once the concepts are embedded within your organisation, you're just managing your business well, mm. efficiently as, as you possibly can be, which hopefully means you're as profitable and as responsible and as socially aware and ethical as you, as you can be. I tend to look at sustainability in two ways. It's going to drive your top line growth because if you are a sustainable business, other organisations will want to work with you. So you're going to win more business. Looking at the SMEs, more SMEs that, that embrace this agenda, they're going to be more attractive to the larger organisations in the supply chain to work with because we've all got to demonstrate to our customers that our supply chain is sustainable. So it's all going to you know, lift all boats you know, make, make us all sustainable. But also it's, it's that opportunity to improve your bottom line. You know, organisations are looking at, generally looking at three areas of savings, water, energy and waste. 
that. And we quickly discovered that there was an 80-20 rule in Viridal. 80% of our power was being used at 20% of our sites. You know, and that's also been the way that our business has changed to become more sustainable. So we, we're recycling material, but to recycle material, we have to become more energy intensive. But from a life cycle point of view, us recovering all this, these plastics and whatever is actually saving carbon, um, but it's pushed our power and, and energy bills up. So um, it's given us an opportunity to look at becoming more energy efficient. But the spin-off benefit of uh, actually dis learning more about your energy use um, more recently has been a view of our energy procurement. So it's not always the obvious things, you know, just installing technology and becoming more energy efficient. It's actually saying, well, now we know how we consume energy, we can better procure our energy. So I'm now heading energy procurement in the company. And I've changed the way we used to have all the sites on fixed contracts. I've taken us into framework, flexible agreements, so we can buy power closer to the point of use, that, that sort of thing. So it, it's almost some of the unexpected benefits that come out of this. It's sustainable business is embedded in everybody's role, takes a life cycle perspective across all the products and services that you are delivering, and you're delivering <coughs> social and economic value, and you're in profit. A sustainable business will be forward thinking, it will be empowered, and it will be adaptable. Uh, wholeheartedly agree, it's a sustainable business is one that's going to be looking beyond, as we started this event, beyond environmental management, but looking at embedding it in every single aspect of what they do to become as efficient as possible. I look at it this way, we've got three billion more customers on the planet between now and 2050. So prosperity for nine billion people without destabilising the Earth's climate or ecosystems.